Hello, 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 and welcome to the Audio Ground School podcast. My name is Nick Smith. I'm your host and founder and creator of Part Time Pilot, online ground schools for private pilot and soon to be IFR. Maybe by the time this episode drops, we might be talking about the initial release of the beta version of our IFR course. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. You know, real quickly, I just wanted to talk about how thankful I am for you guys listening to the podcast. And I was setting goals for 2024, as I do. And I was looking at, you know, the all-time downloads of the podcast, and it's it's over 300,000 downloads now. And I'm thinking, okay, what should my goal for 2024 be at the end of 2024? How many downloads should I have? You know, I was like, okay, I think we should double that. Exponential growth is what we're looking for. I want to double that. I think that's a realistic and high enough setting goal to really strive for. So, and then it kind of hit me that like, my goal is to have over half a million downloads. Like that's crazy to me. So just want to say thank you guys for listening, for downloading. If you haven't subscribed and so you can get those automatic downloads, that's updates and stuff, please subscribe, whether it's, you know, Spotify, Google, Apple, whatever. And please leave us a review. It really, really helps us out and would help me reach that goal. I love meeting my goals. So anything you do to help out with that, that would be great. All right, so a couple announcements. Again, today we're not going to do the the listener kind of questions today or read off any reviews. We'll save that because we're still working on that long lesson on aeronautical charts. But I do have a couple updates. Again, we're still doing live lessons. All right, so we're doing a series of four live lessons. We do them, I try to do it every quarter, right? So every three or four months or so, about the time when we do, uh, you know, our scholarships that we also do once a quarter. I try to do that for our ground school members. This one, you don't have to be a ground school member. You can just sign up with the link in our bio to get the Zoom link for that. You won't be get access to the recording. Ground school members will get access to the recording, but we're doing a series of four. This episode right here is dropping on January 29th. So we will have done, I think we'll have a couple more live lessons. You can check out our social media Actually, let me tell you the schedule here. Let me pull that up. Let's see here. If this is dropping January 29th, we will have two more live lessons you can catch. The third one, which is on weather basics and airspace, that'll be January 31st at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then we'll do one on VORs on February 7th. That's the following Wednesday at 4 p. again at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So the only way to get those Zoom links is you either have to be a member of our online ground school, which again, you know, I highly recommend that. Uh, just go to parttimepilot.com or in the link in our bio, go and just enter your name and email completely free, no credit card information, anything like that. Don't worry. Just we need your email so we can send you the Zoom link. That way we're not just putting it out there on social media or whatever. And then we get some random people to come in and, and aren't there to just fully learn. You know, we kind of we want to vet our audience so that we're there to learn. And at the end of the lessons, we'll do some questions and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that everyone there is serious about learning. All right. The other update is just yesterday, the deadline for our winter $1,000 scholarship was up. I am going through, we're going through all the applications, looking for the most deserving candidate right now and runner up. So we will announce that on our social medias and through email. So another way to sign up for the email, get updates on our scholarships or follow us on social media, Instagram at part period time period pilot or on TikTok, same thing, or on Facebook, you can search for part-time pilot. You can join our study group, part-time pilot, private pilot study group, and then on YouTube, youtube.com slash part-time pilot. Okay. So one last thing is the next scholarship that we're going to be doing is our spring scholarship. And this is a new tradition that we started, you know, every quarter, four times a year, we donate a thousand dollars. It used to be that thousand dollar scholarships for just our online ground school members. Well, then last year we started in the spring, we started a GoFundMe kind of fundraising scholarship to try and use our platform to make an even bigger impact for people. And so that spring scholarship, I will come out with a date soon on the deadline for that. But anyone can apply to that. You don't have to be in our online ground school. And we're going to start the fundraising very soon. So or actually, we're starting it now. So if you have a few extra to give, that link is in the show notes. You can download that. Last year we raised, so we donated $1,000 of our own money. We're doing that. We already did that again this year. And then last year we were able to raise 4000 more for a total of $5,000, which we gave away to three different people. 
How many people we'll give it to, you know, that depends. Last year we voted on it. We'll probably do the same thing again. We'll do a little vote on it. But our goal is to raise $10,000 this year. This year we have some sponsors. So we're looking out for some more sponsors. I'm going to be pushing that real hard here in the next few months to try and beat our goal of reach our goal of $10,000. So that's going to be in the spring, probably sometime in late May. So be on the lookout for that late May, early June. And, you know, when it gets close, we'll release the application for that as well. So that's our spring GoFundMe scholarship. Please, even if it's just five bucks, go and donate. I really want to reach that goal. You know how I love reaching our goals. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to those updates. Let's get into our lesson. As you remember, <laughs> uh, we were in a long lesson on aeronautical charts. So following along in the online ground school, we're in section 16 of the course titled Step 1, where you organize everything by steps in courses. So we have a Step 1 course, we have a Step 2 course, Step 3 course, Step 1 course is all the lessons, quizzes, videos, diagrams, mnemonic devices, all that stuff, right? All the stuff you're going to learn. Step 2 is a practice test. And then step three is a process where we send you a customized report, have you take some more practice tests if you're not ready, and we work with you one-on-one. That's why we have 99.9% success rate with our students passing the written exam, because that's where we really make sure you're prepared, give you your endorsement, and send you on your way. So we're in step one course of that, all the lessons, and section 16 on navigation. Lesson one, aeronautical charts. Last episode, we did the first half of this lesson because it's a long lesson. This episode, we're going to finish that up. So let's go ahead and get to that. So in our last episode, we stopped right after the elevations and train section. So if you're following along, scroll down to the subsection where it says airspaces in big, bold letters. And we're going to start there on airspaces on aeronautical charts. All right. Class A airspace is not represented by anything on aeronautical charts. This is the airspace above 18,000 feet MSL to flight level 600 or 60,000 feet. Class B airspace is represented by a thick, solid blue line on aeronautical charts. The base and ceiling of each class, each section of class B is marked as the ceiling over the base hundreds of feet in MSL. It looks like a fraction, right? So we have an example here, and it's we circled, we have a picture, right, of class Bravo airspace around an airport from a sectional chart, and we've circled the base and ceiling of that airspace in that particular section. So there will always be a fraction of base and ceiling within a closed area of the thick blue borders of class Bravo. So on this example, you can see a couple of these fractions in big, bold blue letters. And that wherever that fraction lies, you might have a little blue arrow to where what section of the airspace that is. So in this example, we have a 100 over 25 on the bottom right of the picture. And then there's a dotted blue arrow that shows what section that applies to. Sometimes you can't quite fit those blue fractions, those big numbers inside of a section. So they'll do that. They'll put it outside and then have an arrow showing you what section it applies to. Or if it does fit in that section, like the one we have circled in red, the 100 and over 25 circled in red, then they'll just put it right inside the section and you know easily what section that is. Sometimes they're very complex and it's kind of hard to see those, where those are. So you got to pay attention, especially on the FA written questions. They have some complex ones like the Dallas Love figure or the Dallas area figure where there's lots of different airspace. It's kind of hard to read. So you really got to pay attention to look for those blue arrows in which area it's talking about. So the 100 over 25, that's in hundreds of feet MSL. So that means the base is 2,500 feet, 2,500 feet MSL. And the ceiling is 10,000 feet MSL in that area, in that boundary of blue airspace. So if you're flying in that area, you know that you have to have Class Bravo clearance if you're between the altitudes of 2,500 and 10,000 feet. So if you don't want to be in Class Bravo, you got to be below 2,500 feet or above 10,000 feet in that area. All right. Class E airspace is marked by thick, solid magenta lines on aeronautical charts. The base and ceiling of each section of Class C is marked as a ceiling over the base in hundreds of feet MSL, just like Class Bravo. In the figure below, the section of Class C airspace with a base and ceiling has 1,600 feet MSL or 1,600 feet MSL and 4,400 feet MSL circled in red. So in this picture, we have the solid magenta lines and the different sections, the outlined sections that make up the Class Charlie airspace. And you can see in each of the sections, there is a 
big bold fraction, big bold magenta fraction that tells us the, the ceiling over the base. So the one we have circled is 44 over 16, and that means the ceiling of the class Charlie airspace in that area, you know, denoted by that solid magenta outline is 4,400 feet and the base is 1,600 feet. So if you didn't want to be in class Charlie airspace, you would have to be below 1,600 feet or above 4,400 feet. Otherwise, if you're flying in those altitudes, you're going to have to have clearance in that area to be in that class Charlie airspace. Class D or class Delta airspace is marked by dashed blue lines. So they're not as thick as the solid blue lines for class Bravo. They're thinner and they're dashed on their aeronautical charts. The ceiling of most Class D airspace is at 2,500 feet above the ground, but charts will list the ceiling in feet MSL. You can always assume the base of Class D airspace is at the surface. So we don't have a fraction. We don't have a base usually for Class Delta airspace. So literally, it usually just lists the ceiling of the airspace. It's usually 2,500 feet above ground. You know, no matter what it is, it will be listed on the aeronautical chart and it's in feet MSL. So it's usually 2,500 feet above ground, but it's only going to say 2,5, right? For hundreds of feet MSL, because people get confused, right? That we say it's 2,500 feet above ground. That's how they determine it. That's how they usually determine the default, unless they need something else, the default ceiling for class delta airspace. They just say, okay, whatever the elevation of the airport is, let's say it's 500 feet. They do 2,500 feet above that. So then the MSL ceiling would be 3,000 feet, right? Because it's 2,500 feet above ground level. So that's why you usually don't see 2,5, right? Unless it would be at sea level. Unless the, the airport's at sea level, then, right, 2,500 feet would be both MSL and above ground level. Hopefully that makes sense. But that's just the default. It doesn't have to always be 2,500 feet above ground level. But it's the default. So in this example, we have 72 so that's 7,200 feet. The ceiling will be marked inside the airspace with blue text inside blue bracket. So it's like a blue square, and then the numbers will be inside of that. And again, it's in hundreds of feet MSL. Class Delta airspace ceilings are listed as an inclusive number unless there is a minus sign in front of the number. For example, if you see 28 in blue text on your chart next to a Class Delta airspace, and this means the airspace extends from the surface, up to and including, it's inclusive, 2,800 feet. But on the other hand, if you were to see minus 28, then this would mean the class delta airspace is from the surface up to and including 2,799 feet. It is, that minus sign means it does not include 2,800 feet in the figure below. So in the figure that we're seeing, it's just 72 with no minus sign. So that means it's up to and including 7,200 feet. So why would they not include 2,800 feet in the example where we had minus 28? Well, if another airspace started at 2,800 feet, maybe there's a class Bravo airspace above it, and they wanted to say, hey, once you hit 2,800 feet, you're in class Bravo. So, so don't hit 2,800 feet if you don't want to be in that class Bravo. That's why they might do that, that minus sign, just as an example. Class E airspace is marked by thick line that fades from a solid magenta on one side to a transparent magenta on the other side. So it's like a shaded line that goes from, you know, solid color to more and more transparent on the other side. Class Echo or Class E is also marked by dashed magenta lines. So there's two different lines that represent Class E, and we'll tell you why the difference. When you see a thick line that fades from solid magenta to transparent magenta, this tells you that when on the solid side of the line, so on the, you know, the more solid side of the line, outside of that part of the line, the Class E airspace starts at 1,200 feet AGL. And when on the transparent side of the line, the Class E airspace starts at 700 feet AGL. Then if you see a dashed magenta line, that tells us that inside this line, the Class E airspace starts at the surface. So it tells you where Class E starts at, depending on what side of these lines you're on. In the figure here that we have, the area inside the dashed magenta line with the red number one circled has Class E that starts at the surface. The area inside the thick magenta line on the transparent side, so inside that circle, if you're looking at the figure, where we see that two, the red two circled, 
has class E that starts at 700 feet AGL. And then the outside of the thick magenta line on the solid side, where you see the red three circled, has class E that starts at 1200 feet AGL. So let me try and describe what this picture looks like. Imagine a, so we have an airport, okay? And we have an uncontrolled airport in the middle. And then we have like a, some sort of shape. It's like a circle with kind of two knobs on top and bottom of it. But it's an enclosed dashed magenta line kind of shape around that airport. Inside that dashed magenta, class E starts at the surface. Now, why would they do this? So class E is controlled airspace. Even though you might not be talking to a tower, it's considered controlled airspace. There's a few more rules than uncontrolled airspace. Class G is uncontrolled, right? So for this airport, although it doesn't have a controlled tower, they still want there to be rules of class E airspace, you know, like VFR minimums and stuff like that. So they have around this airport, they have class E go to the surface. So when you come into land, you still have to abide by those kind of the controlled airspace rules of class E. Then outside that area, right? Outside of that, we have a thick shaded magenta line. It's a circle all around that. So there's a gap. There's a gap between the dash magenta line and then the circle that's larger than that. That's the thick shaded magenta line. And in that gap, right, is area two that we've drawn. And that, so we're on the light transparent side of the thick magenta line. That's where it starts at 700 feet. So class C starts at 700 feet there. And then outside of the circle, the furthest away from the airport, on the solid side of the transparent line, so outside that circle where area three is listed, that's class E that starts at 1,200 feet. So as you get closer and closer to landing at this airport, class E, the floor of class E gets lower and lower. And then we all know that class E ends at 17,999 feet, where class A sits above it at 18,000 feet. So that's class E. Hopefully that made sense and kind of gave you a visual of that. Class G airspace is not marked on aeronautical chart like class A and exists wherever class A, B, C, D, and E do not exist. So there's one kind of caveat to that, which we mentioned in the class G, is that sometimes it is marked on the chart. And that's when it goes up to 14,500 feet. So there are areas in the U.S. where uncontrolled airspace is raised higher altitudes, higher ceilings, uh, usually 14,500 feet. That will be marked on those charts with a line very similar to the class E, that thick shaded line that goes from solid to transparent, where class E was a magenta color. For class G up to 14,500, that's going to be a shaded blue line. So it's just like that. So it goes from like a transparent blue to a solid blue. All right, continue on to prohibited, restricted, warning, or alert areas. These are marked for so these kind of military or special use operations airspace as we like to call it. The prohibited, restricted, warning, or alert areas are marked with blue lines with tallies or dashes or ticks or whatever you want to call them coming out perpendicular in the direction of the contained area. So, for example, we have a picture here of R-4404 B and C. So that's restricted area 4404. And it's a blue circle. And then coming off the blue circle are a bunch of like tick marks, right? And they're pointed towards the inside of the circle in the direction of where that airspace is. So inside that, thing, inside that circle is a restricted area. All right. To find information about a special use airspace, you can look in the margins of the same sectional chart in the special use airspace information tables. In these tables, you can find the special use airspace's operating time, ceiling, controlling agencies, and frequencies. So if you want to know if a a military operations area, a MOA is active, or another type of area is active, or what's going on, you can look at the times of operations in that table, or you can get a frequency if you need them for some emergency or something like that. That's in the margins of your sectional chart. Uh, speaking of MOAs, uh, military operation or MOA is depicted as a magenta line with the same tallies or ticks coming off of them. Let's now move on to nav aids. So nav aids basically are anything that could aid in your navigation, right? So there might be visual things you can see visually, visual landmarks, I think is the word that you could use for, you know, checkpoints or navigational aids to kind of tell you where you are while you're flying. So 
There's a bunch of different ones that will help you with that pilotage and dead reckoning as well as ATC reporting. So we're going to go through those and what they look like. And then if you're following along in the ground school uh, picture, an example of them. The first one is a VFR reporting point. These are usually made at easily distinguishable landmarks such as a lake, water tower, or golf course. Uh, you know, easily visible from the sky, of course. They're often used as visual checkpoints for aircraft to identify their positions when talking to approach or departure control. So this is like, it's a magenta flag here. So it's just like, it looks like a flagpole, almost like a, if you're a golfer, right? The flag stick of a golf hole. It even looks like there's a hole there. That's in this example says water tank. And then underneath it, it has the code for that. So this code in this example is VPLWT and it's collate located so that's the VFR reporting point, COLA located with that VFR checkpoint. The VFR reporting point is that code, the VPL WT, and then the checkpoint is the flag, the magenta flag symbol. And a VFR checkpoint is depicted, again, as a magenta flag, and it's a visual checkpoint used to identify position for initial call up to a nearby approach or tower. So very, very similar thing, but just they're called different things. So it's a VFR checkpoint and a VFR reporting point. Then we have major highways. Major highways are depicted by two parallel gray lines that follow the same direction as the actual highway. The highway below, so the highway in our example, passes from the left to the right between the two private airports. So it's literally just a gray line, double gray line, right? That shows the road. Think of it as showing the edges of the road. So that's a major highway when you see those double gray lines. Now roads, so that would be, major highway, by the way, would be like interstate, right? You know, I grew up in Washington and California, so I-5, Interstate 5, is, you know, a well-known interstate out here. Or the I-10, right, goes, you know, from Southern California all the way east. So that's another one right there. Now, those are, you know, multi-lane major highways. Roads are depicted as winding single gray lines that follow the actual road's path. Again, they follow the actual road path, so you kind of know which direction you might fly. Like, for example, when I flew in Southern California. Highway 8 was depicted on the charts and we would use it for reporting points, navigation. You know, you simply, if you're on a cross-country flight to the desert east, you could just follow Highway 8, stuff like that, right? It makes it easy and it's a very easy visual for VFR flying. But so for roads that aren't major highways, it's just a single gray line. Aeronautical charts only depict roads that the FAA believes are well-traveled and therefore well-known and will be of use to pilots to either A, use as a navigational tool, or B, be used for landing in an emergency. So any road depicted on an aeronautical chart is going to be well-traveled and large enough to see from the air. So not every road is going to be depicted. That's something to remember there. A road can be one of three categories. Category 1, Category 2, Category 3. Category 1 is a dual lane or higher divided highway. So that would be like our major highway. Category two is going to be standard roads with lanes in both directions. And category three is going to be the smallest roads that are depicted on aeronautical chart. We have a figure here. We have two category two roads crossing the north and south category one highway here. So we have category one highway with just the double gray line. And then you see these single gray lines crossing it. Those would be the smaller roads coming off of that interstate. All right, so we have some more kind of snapshots of legends from FAA material that show these category roads, what they look like. We also have symbols for trails. Sometimes they'll have trails in here that are visible. So those are just single gray dashed lines. And then you might have some roads with markers on them that actually tell you, you know, the interstate or the U.S. route number on them. I might, it would just look like the sign, right? The, you know, the, the interstate sign, which is like a I don't even know what symbol that is. It's like a kind of like a uh, those flame flowers. You know that flower that you get in, in Mario that would allow you to throw fireballs? I'm totally speaking to millennials right now. Kind of looks like that. But anyways, it's the interstate sign. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, where it's like red and blue with the number on it. So that might also be depicted on the chart to tell you exactly what interstate it is. All right, moving on. Oh, one last thing. Roads under construction will be double dash lines. So that's like a, you know, they, they might tell you this road is under construction, so you don't use it for emergency landing or something. All right. Railroads are depicted as single black lines with perpendicular notches as seen in the figure below. So you can think of the notches as kind of the railroad ties, right? Pretty self-explanatory. 
makes sense there. Again, another really good visual to follow along or use as a reference point when flying. Telephone lines are depicted with black lines, so black solids, single lines, and they have tiny little cell tower symbols. So telephone, you know those towers, those aluminum towers, they have little symbols of those. Pretty easy to understand what that means. And so you'll have a tower, a line, then tower, and it kind of, it's pretty self-explanatory. Rivers are depicted as meandering blue lines that match the general path of the river. Larger rivers are depicted with two parallel blue lines with light blue filled in between to show the width of the river. So if it's a a small river, it's just a blue line. If it's a larger river, it's going to be, it's going to show the borders of the river as blue lines with light blue in between. So it's going to show like a wider, again, pretty self-explanatory that that's a river. Again, lakes, pretty self-explanatory. It's just like a big river, right? It's got the light blue on the inside and then the border is, you know, a dark blue line. And lakes are also a great reporting point or reporting point or checkpoint, visual checkpoint, whatever you want to use it for. Wind turbines, wind turbine farms are depicted with tiny wind turbine symbols and blue dashed lines surrounding the turbine farm area. So blue dashed lines surrounding the area with literal symbols of a wind turbine, like a wind fan, right? Pretty self-explanatory symbol as well. You'll also see a box depicting the turbine's altitude in feet MSL. If there is a UC next to the altitude, it means the highest wind turbine's height above ground is not verified. So they'll give you the general height of the turbines above ground. So in this example, we have a box inside that blue dashed line area with the, the wind turbine symbols as turbine symbols, 2894 feet, so 2,894 feet. And then it has a UC, so that means it's unverified the exact height of the tallest one. So just something to look out for. Dams are represented by bold black lines over a water feature. So you might have a river or a lake, and then you'll just see a corner of the lake or river, a bold, short black line, right? And that's a dam. Another good visual when you're flying around. Bridges, another good visual, are represented by either the same gray lines of the highway traveling over the water feature or a bold black line over water with skinny little legs on each side. So think of like a bolded black line and then like legs and arms coming off the top and bottom of it. That And it'll be over a body of water, right? So that's a bridge. Okay, so we have examples, pictures, examples of all these here in the lesson. So please check that out. Again, this is a very visual lesson. So go ahead and check that out. All right, next up, we're going to talk about obstacles. Obstacles are reported on aeronautical charts when they are more than 200 feet above ground. So 200 feet AGL and above, they'll be reported on the aeronautical chart. A single obstacle above 200 feet AGL and below 1,000 foot AGL is depicted by an upside down V. Okay, so it's kind of like a a little mountain peak, upside down V and a dot inside the V with its MSL altitude listed next to it. Sometimes the AGL altitude will also be listed inside of parentheses. So in this example, we have a upside down blue V with a dot under it that says next to it 1,473. That's MSL. And then in parentheses, it says 394. So that's the feet in AGL. And then below it, it actually says BLDG. So that, it might also have a note of kind of what it is. So that BLDG is a building. Obstacles 1,000 AGL or higher are depicted with a symbol that resembles a like a Native American teepee. It kind of looks like a, a teepee, all right, <laughs> with a dot underneath it. And then again, it'll have the MSL altitude next to it with the AGL possibly in parentheses. If there are more than one obstructions or obstacles above 200 feet AGL, then they are considered group obstructions and are depicted as an upside down W. Okay, so like a dual peaked mountain kind of thing with two dots when the obstructions are above 200 feet AGL but below 1000 feet AGL. They're depicted as one TP and one upside down V with two dots when one of the obstructions in the group is a thousand feet AGL or higher. Then when there are two obstructions a thousand feet AGL or higher in the obstruction, then it'll be two TPs next to each other with two dots. And again, they'll list the highest MSL altitude and highest AGL altitude in parentheses for that group obstruction. Obstructions may also have tiny intensity lights on them 
These obstructions are depicted the same as any other, but with a spark, like kind of like a spark light symbol, right? Almost like a firework is exploding at the peak of that obstruction symbol. And that represents that they have high intensity lights on top of them. So again, same, same type of thing. Uh, upside down V for less than 1,000 feet AGL, a TP symbol for 1,000 feet AGL or higher. And then the same group of obstructions, there's just going to be kind of like that spark light firework symbol on top of them. And a wind turbine might also have that same spark symbol on them, meaning that it has a high intensity light on it. So that's helpful for night flying to understand what it might be. All right, let's move on to airways, isogonics, and other lines that you might see that we haven't covered yet. VFR airways are depicted with solid light blue lines and labeled with a V followed by three to six numbers that designate the airway. Each VFR airway originates from a VOR radial, and these radials will be listed somewhere along the light blue line. Where these airways intersect will be an intersection symbol, or multiple skinny blue arrows, each pointing in the direction of their airway. Again, this, I'll try to explain that, but the visual is best for this one. These intersecting points are named because they are an important navigational tool Crossing the radials of two VORs gives a pilot a great sense of their location. VFR routes are eight miles in width. In the figure here, we show multiple VFR routes are intersecting at an intersection called Kiefen. So in this picture, we have one, two, three different or four different routes, maybe even five different routes, all intersecting at Kiefen. So they're all kind of coming to this one point. We have, for example, Victor 18 which it means, you know, VFR Route 18, Victor 243, and 415, Victor 321. And then we have a T route as well, which don't need to know too much about uh, unless you get to go into IFR. So we won't go into too much detail on those. But, and then at the intersection point, you have these solid blue arrows, which show the direction of each route that goes out of that intersection. That's just kind of a denotation of, hey, here's an intersection of route. So if we had a route going perfectly north and south, and then another route perfectly east and west, right where those cross, there would be a solid blue arrow pointing in the direction of the north route or north or south route, and then a solid blue arrow pointing in the direction of the east-west route, make like a plus sign, right? So it'd be a little solid blue arrow plus sign that would say, hey, this is an intersection. This one looks like, a, you know, like a star symbol because there's so many lines intersecting here. But that tells you there's an intersection. And then we have another example here of VFR airways coming out of a VOR, you know, dial of VOR compass rows on our aeronautical chart. And each is labeled with their associated radial. So when it comes off of the VFR route, it tells you the radial off that VOR that that route is. So in this example, we have a 276, you know, there's a route off the 276, there's a route off the 293 radial, and there's a route off the 341 radial. So you know which radial dial in and track outbound out of this VOR if you want to be on that VFR route. All right, military training routes are another type of route, and they can be labeled for a VFR route or an IFR route. VFR routes are labeled with a VR followed by either three or four digit number. IFR routes are labeled with an IR followed by either three or four digit number. If the number following VR or IR is three digits, then the airway has at least one leg above 1500 feet AGL. If the number is four digits, then the airway is less than 1500 feet AGL. So this private pilot should exercise extreme caution when flying low through one of these and should only pass perpendicularly so as not to linger in the route very long. These routes are shown as gray lines, as in the example here, where we show IR743 and VR1743. So in this example, the IR route should be assumed to have at least one leg above 1,500 feet because it has just three digits in the number. While the VFR route, which has four digits in its number, can be assumed to have the entire route below 1,500 feet AGL. So that tells you on the VFR route that if you're above 1,500 feet AGL, it gives you a sense of security that you know, you're not going to be in that route as long as you maintain above that 1500 feet AGL. However, for to be cautious, always cross the route. Don't follow along that route. Even if you're above that, just cross it perpendicularly and get on a VFR route or some other route. Now let's talk about Mosey Veil. It's another kind of line, more like a circle 
kind of like airspace lines, is a thick and solid magenta line that is usually circles a large class Bravo airspace with a 30 nautical mile radius. This line is meant to determine the area surrounding a busy airspace in which aircraft are required to have a mode C transponder. This applies from the surface up to 10,000 feet MSL. These lines are usually labeled as seen in the example. So it's a solid magenta line circle around an airport, and it has a radius of 30 nautical miles. So it's all 30 nautical mile radius around that airport is a mode C veil, which means you got to have a mode C when you're inside that circle, and it's going to be labeled as mode C 30 nautical miles. Not all of them are labeled, but most of them are labeled. IFR routes are used by pilots in ATC to provide a smooth flow of traffic for IFR aircraft. You know, as a VFR pilot, you won't be using these, but it's good to know what they look like. They're depicted as slightly transparent blue arrowheads and sometimes are accompanied by a transparent blue jumbo jet symbol. These are the routes typically flown by large commercial aircraft. Kind of gives you an idea as a VFR pilot where to expect IFR traffic or large aircraft traffic. So we have arrowheads, these like shaded light blue arrowheads. You might see a big jumbo jet with four engine symbol. That means a really big, big arrival route or departure route for IFR. IFR departures and arrivals or, or other routes. All right, then we have VFR transition routes. These are used by ATC to organize the flow of VFR aircraft near busy class Bravo airspaces. These lines are depicted either as either single or double-sided magenta arrow. So it's not a, a filled-in magenta arrow. It's just an outline of a magenta arrow. But if it's a unidirectional route, it's just you know an arrowhead on one side. If it's a bidirectional route, arrowheads on two sides. And then bidirectional with NAVAID ident and radial, then it'll have the NAVAID identifier, like in this example, VNY, and the radial, which is in this example, 140. A sectional chart may be whited out in a thick line around a large city with the letters TAC inside the line. This is identifying the area in the terminal area chart of that city or airport. A terminal area chart, as mentioned before, is a more zoomed in view of an area to get more detail for the purpose of operation near that airport. So if you see a just white thick line around like an airport, and it says TAC in it, everything inside that border is going to be shown on the terminal area chart. So if you want to see more detail in that area, you know that there's a terminal area chart that you can look at to get that information. Finally, because Earth's magnetic field varies depending on where we are on the planet, remember variation, we how to correct from a true course to a magnetic course, we correct for variation. Isogonic lines show the strength of Earth's magnetic field at specific locations on the map. So Isogonic lines tell us the variation of where we're flying, right? So if we see an isoc, so when we're charting our cross-country course on a sectional chart, we measure our course and true course with our plotter, and then we look for the closest isogonic line to get the variation, and we apply that variation to get our magnetic course. Pilots use these lines, again, to convert, to do that conversion. In the example here, so this line is a dashed magenta line, and it usually spans somewhat from north to south, but kind of at an angle. It's meant to kind of, it's an isogonic line, right? So iso means the same. You might have heard of like isobaric lines. Those lines show where the same pressure is. Isogonic lines show where the same variation is. So all along that line, you have the same magnetic variation. It usually kind of goes from the poles, right, to kind of the equator, the magnetic variation. You can look at a picture of the magnetic field lines around Earth. They change often, but anyways, <laughs> I'm getting off topic. So in this example here, we have a dash magenta line, and inside it says 7 degrees west. So that's the variation. The variation is 7 degrees west. Again, west is best, so we add the variation 7 to our true course to get our magnetic course. If that was east, if it was like 7 degrees east, we would subtract it to our true course to get our magnetic course. All right, other information boxes. We have already covered in detail what goes into airport information and communication boxes like those for a VOR on sectional charts. But there are other boxes of information you may see. Some of these boxes are caution boxes, and some of these are simply information that the FAA deemed important enough for the chart, but didn't want to disguise it as another symbol 
The figures we're about to show here in the course, and I'll describe, are the first one is an informational box notifying pilots that high-performance military jet activity should be anticipated at 8,000 feet and below within 12 nautical miles of NFW airport. So it can these informational boxes can say all sorts of things. So I'm not going to give you every single example, but just one example is military jet activity, right? Or another example might be like parachute activity. There's like a skydiving school or, or something like that, or skydiving place. They might have information box about that or like drone activity, right? And this other figure, we have a caution box that tells pilots to be cautious of high density of military operations in vicinity of Oceana NAS and Fentress NALF military sites. Caution boxes may include any caution that the FAA deems necessary to notify pilots about in the area. Might also be, you know, uh, firework shows, you know, if there might be, you know, Disneyland, some place that has fireworks like every night or every week, it might show information about those. Finally, last thing we want to talk about is time zones. Now, these aren't really depicted on charts, but I felt like this was a fitting place to put the information on time zones rather than have it in its own lesson. The time zone chart can also be considered an aeronautical chart, right? Every weather report is associated with a time that the data was gathered or a time that the data is forecast for. The figure here is kind of the figure similar to the figure you'll see in your airman testing supplement. So in your airman testing supplement, there is a figure that tells you the time zones around the United States. You don't have to memorize this 100% because you get that airman testing supplement on your FA written exam. However, it's good to, it'll, it'll help make things faster if you do remember it. It's not that hard to remember. The Pacific Standard Time Zone is minus eight hours. So everything's reported, you know, as it relates to Zulu time or Green Munich time. And I always get that wrong, Green Munich time. But maybe I got that wrong again. I, I always forget what that is. Green Munich time? Is that what it is? Or Green Greenwich Mean Time? I've heard, I don't, I don't know what it is. Anyways, GMT, whatever GMT stands for, hopefully that's correct. But we call it Zulu time, right? So the Pacific Standard Time is minus eight hours from Zulu time during non-daylight savings month. And then during daylight savings month, it's minus seven hours. Mountain standard time is minus seven in standard time or minus six in daylight savings. Central standard time is minus six or minus five daylight savings. And Eastern is minus five of Zulu or minus for standard and my, or minus four on daylight savings. So I usually like to think about this, you know, to remember it, right? Starting Eastern time, going to West Coast Pacific time. I usually remember the standard time. So I think of Eastern, I know, is minus five from Zulu. So then you go Central is next. As we move West, it's minus six. Mountain is next, minus seven. To Pacific is minus eight. Then if it's daylight savings, I just add one to all of those, right? So instead of so eastern starts at minus four, then central is minus five, mountain is minus six, and Pacific is minus seven. So that means if you have a Zulu time of, say, 10 hundred Zulu, and you want the eastern time, and it's we're not daylight seven, so it's standard time, you subtract five hours. So 10 hundred minus 0500 is 0500. So, right, 10 minus five is five. 0500 would be the eastern standard time at 10 hundred Zulu time. All right, so that's kind of how that works. Now the FAA might give you a word problem where they, they say you're taking off from one time zone, traveling for a certain amount of time in the air, and then landing in another time zone. They will leave one of these three times out of the equation and ask you to determine the other. One thing to easily be tripped up on is daylight savings time and standard time. So remember to make sure you remember that and make sure you take note of which one the question wants you to use because with questions involving Zulu time, this becomes important. So what I mean by that is read the question carefully. You know, first, is it standard or daylight, right? Boom, boom. Then which time zone or which time zone does it want the answer in? Is it Zulu time? Is it Pacific? Is it standard? Blah, 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 blah. And then the way I like to do it is I like to keep just everything in, in Zulu to, or one time zone, right? The whole time until the very end, then I convert to what it wants. Okay, so let's do an example. If you take off from an airport in Eastern time zone at 0800 Zulu, 
and complete a flight of three hours to the central time zone during times of daylight savings, what will be the local time of your arrival? So the first thing I do is I keep everything in Zulu time. So we take off at 0800 Zulu. Doesn't matter. We're not thinking about time zones yet, okay? We take off 0800 for a three-hour flight, and we land. What time do we land? 1100 Zulu. Flight took three hours. Nothing changed. You know, we're not in a time machine here, right? Took three hours, so 0800 to 1100 Zulu. That's when we land is 1100 Zulu. Now, what is it asking for? It wants to know what will be the local time of your arrival. Well, we landed locally in the central time zone. So it wants the central time zone, and then it says during daylight savings. So it wants central daylight time. So what's the conversion of central Zulu to central daylight time? Well, eastern daylight time is minus 4. Then we move to central daylight time, minus 5. So it's minus, the correction is minus 5. So we landed at 1100 Zulu. Minus 5 is 0600 central daylight time. That's it. That's all you got to do. Uh, I, I know the way they word these problems where you got different time zones, it can get confusing. Just keep it in one. I prefer to just do it in Zulu. Keep it in Zulu or keep it in whatever it gave to you, right? No need to do X or conversions. Keep it in whatever it gave it to you. So in this example, it gave it to us the first time at Zulu. Travel in that time, land in that time, right? So it took three hours for us to travel. We landed at 1100 Zulu. Then figure out what it wants you to convert to. That way you're only doing one conversion and it, it simplifies it. Okay, good resources for more chart symbols. So I told you guys that I wanted this to be one of the best guides for private pilots on aeronautical charts. But at the same time, I didn't want to dive too much into the weeds on things that, to be honest, aren't exactly worth knowing uh, when you're preparing for your exams, right? I don't want you to rack your brain and spend time memorizing every single symbol on these charts because I think your time is best spent, you know, understanding more important concepts and stuff. Not to say it's not important. If you do memorize all of them, not to say that's not awesome. So go ahead and do that if you want to. But I didn't have everything in here, right? I just put the stuff that I think you should know for your exams and for your flight lessons. Okay. So there's a couple links. There's the FAA chart user guide. You can click on that link and download that PDF user guide for charts from the FAA. And then there's another link, I believe it's from Texas A&M University, that has some additional symbols not found in that FAA chart. So there's, there's a lot of different symbols out there. FAA seems to always come up with new ones. So those two links should be helpful. I'll put those in the show notes. Okay, I'm glad this lesson's over. I don't know about you guys, but it's tough to explain symbols for almost two hours. What's next? All right, so... We're in section 16 on navigation of the online ground school. We just finished lesson one on aeronautical charts. So we got lesson two and lesson three left to go. Lesson two is on pilotage and dead reckoning. And lesson three, we're going to talk more details of VORs, DMEs, TACANs, and Vortex. So that's going to be an important one. We've kind of held it off till now, but VORs is one of the most asked about subjects for private pilots. It's a confusing thing, and it's not going away, unfortunately. Even though, you know, GPSs are becoming more and more used, they're going to keep a minimum network of VORs as a backup in the U.S. for the foreseeable future. So we got to learn VORs. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So we'll talk about those there. And we're also, by the way, going to do VORs on one of our live lessons coming up, the last one that you can still get the Zoom link for if you go to the link in our bio. Just enter your email for free the Zoom link. That way we'll email you the Zoom link when you sign up like that the day before, and you can watch our live lesson on VORs as well. All right. So thank you guys for listening so much and be on the lookout for the winners who will announce the winners of our scholarship here probably this week as you're listening to this. So follow us on social media, Instagram at part period time period pilot. Same thing on TikTok, youtube.com slash part time pilot or Facebook. You can search part time pilot or our study group, which is the part-time pilot, private pilot study group. Okay, lots of talking. I'm done talking. Thank you guys. Good luck with your flight lessons, ground school, all that stuff. And let me know if you have any questions. All right, bye. Hi. 
anyway i just took my exams and i am so thankful to nick for being there for me i am a mother i am a professional i am a wife i am a daughter i am a community worker so given all these roles that i have to fulfill every day the 24 hours is not enough and i was at the verge of just giving it up my dream it's not my profession it's just my wish to be able to be a pilot so do i have to do this can i do this i was at a point where i thought when i thought this is it i can do it maybe in my next life that's when part time pilot i really mean it i googled and it popped up it's called part time pilot and i asked my family should i just send the money and try it why not i tried it and i'm telling you money well spent and i can't tell you there are so many commercial courses excellent tree you know th- kind of theory they all give you similar theory that you need to pass this test but what is so special about part time pilot nick is special he is a great teacher he never turns you down he is available on the speed dial um you can text him you can send him and shoot him an email you can contact him via facebook you know there is never a time i really mean it this is not an ad i'm just saying it because i'm so grateful for what he has done and um, you know no matter what how simple the question is i'm not at all good with math and i would ask him how do you do that and he would simplify that for me so i really really want to say this simply because i scored 92% and that is a great achievement given where i started this journey from you know so i would like for all those people like me who are out there struggling and second guessing whether you can do this or not please make use of part time pilot and nick will get you there show him your dedication and he will get your dream come true love it nick keep doing what you're doing this is not for money man you're not a commercial guy you are an excellent teacher you teach from your heart and you know it is felt um in every session that you run hours and hours the money that you charge me is nothing the hours that you gave me is everything what a lovely knowledge to learn from you all right have a great one guys if you need any help nick is there just jump in and get that part time pilot support so that he can continue to do what he is doing great work great pilot nick take care bye bye guys